Good afternoon. Welcome back. Uh, my name is Yelena Sobolevska. I'm coming from Accenture Baltics, if you're seeing me today for the first time. And I'm here to introduce to you Andrei Divyatkin, our next speaker. Hi, Andrei. How are you today? Hello. Hello. Good morning. Um, good time of the day to everyone who is joining online. Yeah, probably nice some food. people will listen to you with the lunch in their hands because uh, in our okay. lands, people like to eat at 12 o'clock. So it's it's going to be very, very productive lunch for many people. <laughs> so to keep you entertained during the lunch. <laughs> Andre, you are co-founder and principal consultant, cloud engineering specialist. So how is it to be a, a co-founder? It's busy. Usually it's busy, especially in a small company. But I like it this way. So I like this type of business comparing to sitting on the meetings all day in a bigger company. So we are boutique consulting, we are moving fast, and our clients are startups who are also moving quite quickly. So there is very little talk and a lot of doing. So I, I, I like it this way. I, I did do consulting before for CICD for big companies. And uh, now I'm more with the cloud and the smaller companies, more where things are moving faster, I'd say. And this is how I like it. Maybe it will change in five years. Maybe I would want to do something else. Maybe I will replace us, who knows? But so far, I'm in a totally happy place where I want to be. Maybe after five years, you become a big consultant's company. <laughs> <laughs> well, we actually have a deliberate choice of staying small. So we set an upper limit for ourselves. We shouldn't be more than 10 people because um, it, it's becoming a lot of management. You know, you have to manage people, you have to help them and so on and so on. Now we are, I think, five or six and it's totally fine. We have very little, in a sense, of bureaucracy or management. We actually can focus on what we love and focus on helping customers. So it's going to be a small company, but it might go into something else. I don't know, maybe we do product one day. Who knows? Great idea. I know what you mean. I work in Accenture and I have 140 DevOps uh, under kind of, yeah. and uh, it is a lot of bureaucracy, but yeah, it, it, you have to choose. Either you grow like this, yeah, or, or, or focus on the customer. Great. I wanted to ask about your DevSecOps uh, podcast as well. How often do you record it? How does it work? Uh, we record quite frequently, but not everything actually comes out eventually. So we have our bar set quite high about what material comes out. So and as it goes now, we post about one episode a month. Mm -hmm. And uh, the whole idea behind the podcast is to keep it practitioners for practitioners. So we discuss what we do, we discuss the tools we use, we deliberately doesn't take any advertisement money so we could actually uh, talk honestly about things, how they are. Um, well, I specialize in AWS and again, I could talk about good things, about bad things. Uh, we again trying to keep it small, not, not easy going, like a hobby, so it doesn't, you know, become a chore where you need to sit down, where you need to record, where there are expectations, people waiting for the episode to come out. Spon you have a sponsor's pressure, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So no, we we actually want to keep it easy going, where we talk to the practitioners like ourselves, sharing the problems that we observe each day. And it might have been perfect and be fine with that. So, again, the same as with consulting, a little bit of easy going and being happy where you are and as small as you are. Thank you very much for this useful hobby for our community because uh, security is a very important topic in, in DevOps world and a great source of knowledge and, uh, you know, really, really important for the community. So big thank you for that. Uh, thank you for chatting with me. The stage is yours with uh, Terraform, why people keep writing Terraform wrappers. Very interesting topic. So, Andre, stage is yours. 
Ah, perfect. That's it. So I can click this. Hold on. Let's switch very quickly. Well, this talk was long coming, and finally it is here. It's not only my ideas about issues with Terraform and why people writing rapid is Elsa coming from experience of my fellow consultants on 5XL. And uh, I want to start by talking about podcasts. We already touched on that. And this is some of the podcasts I listen. I, I really like podcasts. And I think you can tell quite a bit about the person from looking at what podcasts they listen. And you might see that, well, there is quite many historical podcasts because I'm into history. There is a, our podcast that we do with Julian and Matthias that we just mentioned. And uh, there is also Security Now, which is a great podcast. And I would say it's an example of how podcasting needs to be done. Steve doing this amazing job. And I would be happy to, do, to get to his level one day. But I guess it will take time. And I'm mentioning Security Now the only because it's greatness, but also I want to tell you a story that I heard on uh, on a podcast the other week. So one of the hosts uh, back in the days were programming on a Commodore 64, and he uh, was writing a 3D program that would rotate the geometrical shapes, and he did spend four months doing that. And then something happened with the tape recorder. This is where people used to store their programs and tape, and he lost all of that. And it, we might relate to that by thinking of, you know, doing coding locally, and then you think you have no changes in your repository, you do git reserved hard, and then you realize that you haven't saved your changes, now they're gone. So the same type of story here, he just lost his changes. And then he spent just four weeks rewriting that. So first four months, then four weeks, because he kind of knew where he going. And it took him less time. When he did that, he realized that he now knows how to do it right. And he rewrote the program one more time. And uh, basically spending only four days on that. And then he said, well, you first do it, to understand how you how you do it at all, then you do it better, and then you have all the knowledge necessary to do it right. And this is what we've been doing in 5Excel, helping startups to get the AWS infrastructure on the ground. We did it one time, we did it second time, third time, many times, and we did it always with Terraform. So I, I think now we have a little bit of idea of how you would do it right. And we do a, a, see a cert, certain conceptual problems that arise. And this is what I want to talk about today. So in order to understand those problems, we would have to take a journey of a typical DevOps person, call, call, call the person, whatever you like, platform engineer, whoever, uh who is trying to bootstrap infrastructure for the startup and we will face the, those problems as they come on us at us right so the same as with this road we are standing here we actually don't really see what this will be uh after the next hop or the turn before we get there so we will take in stages and i will be taking you through this journey Andrea Devatkin, you already heard my name, uh, co-founder of 5XL, co-host of the DevSecOps Talk podcast, AWS Community Builder, and public speaker. Happy to be talk talking at DevSecOps Pro, uh, DevOps Pro. Again, I'm returning guest here. And uh, amazing conference. Each time, happy to be here. So there is not only Terraform, but there are else of writers, and those that I could came up with just by sitting one minute in front of the monitor. And I think you actually might know more than this. So if you do post that in the comments and I will take a look into the presentation, uh, to your comments later on and you will incorporate them in the presentation. But there are a lot of wrappers and um, why are they there? What are the problems? And another thing to address is, well, you might say, well, only three Terraform problems. I can give you 20 and people then complaining about Terraform issues. 
there are issues for sure, but I want to focus on a particular conceptual issues rather than technical problems. Those conceptual problems they arise from technical limitations, but they're not technical problems per se. And if you ask Chad GPT about what are the possible problems could be, he comes up with those things, and they actually doesn't really match with what I have in mind. I have those. So we have dynamic state location, we have environment-specific parameters, and we have cross-state resource lookup. And uh, we will have to do assumptions during the presentation, and science, I work with AWS exclusively, so I can't really tell for other uh, cloud provider, so all my examples will be around AWS, but they are as applicable to other cloud providers as well. And we will have imaginary startup taking on the road and building their product, trying to present that product to the public and capture the market. So the first thing they do is they log into AWS, they create an account, and they want to bootstrap the EC2 instance where they're going to host everything they got, and uh, they, heard, uh, they heard a little bit about security, so they specify metadata options and stuff like that. And uh, they also decided to start with infrastructure as code. So we have a small Terraform snippet. We have this directory where we have README describing the infra repo. We have the Terraform directory where Terraform keeps its files, like temporary files, like a cache of providers information about uh, backend that you initialized. We have main TF itself that we just saw, and then we have terraform.tf state, which means that terraform state, that all information about resources it knows, actually stored in a local directory, which is not good. Because if we would like to run CI, for instance, if we would run to this code through CI, then it will not work because CI will have no access to the Terraform state. So we need to put that somewhere. And usually what people do, they just go to S3, create an S3 bucket and put state there. And they add this type of block to the Terraform specification. And you could see the bucket name is my cool startup name. And people totally do that, like all the time. They just put prefix of their company name in front of the S3 bucket to do attribution easier for attackers. So uh, a new assumption, so we have S3 backend, right? So we're using AWS, we have S3 backend. We will just keep those assumptions written down. And so far, so good. There is no need for wrapper, no, no need for anything. Everything is super simple. ABC of Terraform. And we arrived to the second season of our startup story, where now they actually need to deploy the application to the new environment. And usually it happens so that startup would have one account, and they will just start that as a prod, and then they want to build development account where they would do development before they deploy to production. So. We, for the sake of this example, we're going to have development and production. We will have no staging, but everything we say will apply to as many environments you would like. So now we have two different accounts, and uh, we need to change backend configuration depending on which environment we are, because we don't want to override Terraform state. So if you remember, this is the configuration we had. And the key points to where the Terraform state is stored in our S3 bucket. So we want to change that depending if we are in development or production. So we're going to use variables, but we can't because this is a technical limitation of Terraform. It doesn't allow interpolation of variables in a backend configuration. And if you would like to have to know more, I have a, I have a reference to the issue in a, in a bottom of the slide, and all the slides will be available after the conference. Now, can we use Terraform workspaces? You probably heard about Terraform workspaces, don't you? And if we go to the Terraform documentation, they say that they could be useful in some cases, and there are alternative approaches. There is this chapter saying that we're well, not to use multiple workspaces. And here, what they're saying is that 
you should be using them when you want to switch between multiple instances for a single configuration. And single configuration will be our main tier file. And we want to deploy it multiple times. And within a single backend, right? So like S3 bucket. So you could technically have multiple uh, uh, multiple state files there, but it will be the same bucket in a way I understand this. And uh, what they suggest as an alternative is you use modules, you put everything you create into modules, and then you create a directory called, for instance, dev, where you have main TF, which will have hard code at S3 configuration, and then reference to the model. And then you will have the same for production with a different S3 configuration. And uh, if you're paying attention, you should be telling yourself right now, wait a second, this actually reminds me something. And this is what probably reminds you. This is exactly if you read the book Terraform Up and Running, if you ever use Terragrant, this is basically what Terragrant, how to proposes you to do. You create directories where you have Terragrant HCL, and that will contain your S3 configuration, and it will point to the models from where you want your applications. And you could see that Terragrant can do a little bit of trickery. It actually can run its own function on, on top of the backend configurations to make it more dynamic, if you would like to. So a, a lot of similarities in, in the, what uh, Terraform describes in its uh, documentation and what Terragrant proposes. But we are getting a lot of directories. And uh, Terragrant says, well, it's about dry, right? So do not repeat yourself. But when you have so many directories, you will end up repeating yourself anyway, even if the file content is very small. And you will still have some minor differences. And I actually saw examples where people didn't adhere to that convention and the difference grew quite large. So can we just use the same directory somehow? And we actually can. So there is a thing uh, in uh, Terraform called partial configuration, where you do not have to commit the whole configuration to the repository. And you could use command line arguments for Terraform in need to pass that. So imagine, oops, we have this, right? Uh, instead of having this committed to the Git repository, we could actually have empty block. And when we run Terraform in it, we could dynamically pass this configuration. And this configuration might differ from environment to environment. So we would have to probably change an S3 bucket. So do we share a S3 bucket between environments? Or do we use the same bucket? I I seen proposals where people use workspaces and they say you have one account where you have S3 bucket and from there you assume roles to other accounts and provision infrastructure there and store state in that S3 bucket. But then if somehow someone from dev get access to the bucket, you will also have state from production in the same bucket. And Remember, you have all your secrets, all secrets that you pass the Terraform. They are stored in your state. So you have to present, you have to protect your state. Which So that's why I don't think having the same S3 bucket and sharing that between environments is a good idea per se. So we will continue with a separate bucket per each environment in our discussion here. So. Now we're going to be changing the buckets. How do we call them? And I suggest we do something like this. We call the bucket infrastate dash 12 digits. If you're paying attention, you might guess what it is. And you might ask, if you don't, you might ask, like, why would we call the bucket this way? Well, this is because the bucket name should be unique. So we need to have a way of introducing unique bucket names. And we do that with a suffix. And what is a suffix? Uh, the suffix is actually AWS account ID. 
So this way we will always get a unique bucket name per account, right? And uh, now you might be asking, are we getting into trouble by publicly exposing account ID? Isn't it that a sensitive information? And there is a quite a bit discussion. If you Google that, you will see that there is a lot of discussion around that. AWS in their documentation states that account ID is not sensitive. And there is a great article by Corey Queen, which I recommend you read on the topic if you want to know more. But at the same time, it's kind of sensitive because if I know your account ID, I can try to convince AWS support that I is you and try to take over the account. So you have options, actually. You could have plain account ID, if you like, or you could have this paranoid edition where you would show on the account ID and you get the hash. And well, reverting MD5 is somewhat easy. There are enough rainbow tables. Reverting SHA1 is not as easy. You can still brute force it, since it's only 12 digits. So, but it makes it a little bit harder for people. And you might ask, be asking, why not to just use suffix like production and development and our full company name in front as a prefix? Well, this actually will get you in trouble because, first of all, when you as soon as you start writing bucket policies, and it will not apply for the state bucket because you don't want that bucket shared between accounts. But when you start writing policies to share buckets between accounts, having those prefixes will create a hell for the policies because you will your policies will be different for development, your policies will be different for production. Well, even just bucket access policy, you need to specify bucket, bucket name in the policy itself which means that you cannot generate the same policy for production development because uh, the machine that applies your uh, changes in CI, it needs to know, am I in production or am I in development? So you need to pass that as either a variable of some kind, or you could use some machine readable information that you can look up in the runtime, like account ID which makes it much easier and allows you to create the policies that could be reused across environments without passing variables in there. So there is actually multiple reasons why you want to do something like that. So another question that you might be asking now, so we're using the same directory, we're passing the S3 backend configuration dynamically, but will we get in trouble with the Terraform directory? Because Terraform stores uh, important information there that it needs to be running. And if we initialize two different environments in the same Terraform directory, we will be in trouble, right? So we could work around that by using TF data deal. And uh, that will allow us to override the beha default behavior of Terraform and have a different name or different place of this directory. So I know it's kind of getting complicated enough to do it manually. And uh, that's probably a time we go ahead and write our own wrapper, right? I did promise that, now we're doing it. And uh, we will not get fancy with Goldline, the rest of Python. We will just use a plain bash because in our case, bash is pretty much enough. What's happening here is we're just exporting a bunch of environment variables. And the uh, important thing here is we're getting environment ID as uh, by calling AWS CLI. And environment ID in this particular example is equal account ID. From that, we could uh, get a bucket name, assuming the bucket already exists. Then we can calculate the state pass on line 11 using the repository name. And then we pass the TF state file name if we want to. We define TF data deal to be different and have environment ID as a suffix. And now we're ready to do Terraform we need. And uh, 
run Terraform executable. I now thinking that on a on a line 20, I have Terraform executable environment variable, and I probably need to have that on line 15. But anyhow, you get the point here. We, with this, we are able to dynamically switch backends depending in which account we are and actually use files from the same directory. If you're paying attention, there is also a use of AWS default region environment variable in a, and we need to set it somehow. And uh, I suggest you keep it easy and you use amazing AWS world CLI tool for setting up your AWS uh, variables and keeping your AWS configuration secure and safe, not in your AWS.config file that anyone could steal. So now our repository would look like this. We have new two new .terraform directories, depending on which environment we are, those are account IDs and end. And uh, we still have our main .df, which brings us to the third season of our startup, and where they need to do a little bit of difference between the environments. So since we created development, we might not need to have as big a machine as we have in production for the development purposes. So how do we go about differentiating the bringing those changes depending on the environment. Well, Terraform allows you to achieve that in multiple ways. So you could use Terraform Cloud Workspace. You could pass a var common line argument. You could store your variable values in a TF4 files, and you can set environment variables. So multiple ways, and I'm gonna go with the number three is tf force file. So now our configuration is evolving a little bit. You can see that on top, now we have Terraform backend S3. We're telling uh, Terraform that we actually gonna be using S3 backend to store our state, but details will come later. And then down below at line 27, we added variable that we are using at line 16. So now instead of hard coding the instance type, the instance size, if you like, we're passing that as a variable to our Terraform configuration. Thus, we also add two additional files into this directory and the file will have account IDs in front followed by TFRs and they will come in the instance type sizes and to keep it easier for developers to understand who is who because well developers do not remember account IDs by heart as some of us do uh, we put a comment there so they know what they're changing now we just need to dynamically pick up those tier 4 files and we will modify our wrapper to do so and I understand that it might be hard to do a visual diff on those. So here's a little bit of visual aid for you. So that we modify the last part and we checking if there is environment ID.tfr file in the current directory. We're just defining additional variables that will be passed together with a, whatever Terraform command uh you specified. And the good thing is that you actually since we're running init all the time, it the running Terraform will take a little bit longer, but you will always keep your models initialized because it's a separate pain in the back. You change the model version, and now you go and you need to re-init the Terraform. So you're actually making sure that you don't need to manually run in it by running it all the time. It might take a little bit longer, but it's unacceptable. Right, so do we really need a wrapper for this? Well, yes and no, right? So. You could actually, if you go back to what Telegram is doing or what uh, HashiCorp recommends in the documentation, if you have separate directories for development and production with hard-coded 
S3 backend configuration, you could actually have those values in those directories and then pass them to the model that would create the instance, right? So technically, you could achieve the same by using convention, or you could use a wrapper. And that's the choice that ultimately falls on the person doing the job. Uh, which brings us to the next uh, season, right? So we're moving on, and um, what we got here is a little bit complication, right? You, like, as any startup does now, they want to rewrite everything and do microservices. The business model is working, whatever they quickly build as MVP is falling apart, they need to change that, they need to scale it to uh, so they can serve more customers, which means that they probably will be deploying multiple instances, adding VPC configurations, load balancers. So we actually, like as a consultant, usually come in here and help them scale when they have MVP working and we're just making sure it works on the larger scale they need to, to cover. And uh, which means that we will not have a single Terraform configuration. It will be just too big. We could cram everything into that, but running Terraform plan will take forever. And that will be not manageable in the long run. So we will have to splice in multiple states, which uh, brings us to the definition of stacks. And I taking this definition from infrastructure's code book. You could have a link at the bottom of the page as usual. And, uh, and there it's defined as a single single stack definition that could be instantiated as a stack instance. And this is exactly what we are doing. We are deploying our Terraform configuration, which will represent our stack to development, to production, to different environment, creating different instances of them. And that brings us to another thing that we need to address is Terraform code composition. So how do you slice the Terraform code into the multiple pieces that you could apply individually? And uh, this is the talk on its own, and I will not go deep into that. But there is quite nice YouTube talk if you want to start somewhere. Start there. There is also uh, Terraform best practices uh, online book by Anton Babienka. You can Google that one. He has recommendations. So. We will not go deep in here, but it will pretty much depend on how you structure your Terraform specification and how you slice and dice it. Because ultimately, you will get to this question. And now I have one piece of Terraform that defines my networking, for instance, I, where I have my VPC. And uh, how do I tell what VPC ID to use to my application? which sitting in different Terraform specification. And this is the problem with all other tools, like CDK, what have you. Uh, because you, 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 you will have a different space anyways. And uh, there are multiple ways to go about that. Now, there is a Terraform remote state data source. So you could actually tell Terraform, like, you know what? There is a remote source, uh, there is remote state over there. Go read it. And I want to use its outputs, which gives you a certain level of abstraction, but it's a little bit fragile, I would say. And uh, another thing to mention that actually TerraGrant does a lot of that in the background. So you could, like, based on where you are in which directory, it can go and look up a state of other things and give you the outputs if you want to refer to something. So usually people don't do that, actually. Like when people who use vanilla Terraform, I haven't seen that being used a lot. We are not recommending using that either. And those are the things that you could consider using. So I saw people generating in JSON files, placing them to S3. You have AWS SSM parameters where you want one repository or like one Terraform state can write and then other repositories can read from. You could have your tooling set environment variables like this TF4 and providing those data because to be honest, your VPC 
ID will not change as frequently, right? So you could actually prop in your internal tooling that you use, that you use to set your environment, you could maybe set those environment variables, depending on environment you are. And there is a concept of self-containing models, which is architectural construction, constru contraption, I would say. And this is something that we've been playing around in 5XL for some time. This idea, idea keeps evolving. And uh, this is what I want to share with you here. I haven't seen this being told much about in other talks. So self-contained models, what is all about? Your models, they do create resources, right? And then you need to look up those resources somehow, somewhere. And the thing is then you need to know attributes of those resources when you're doing your lookup. So you need to know a name, a tag, an ID of some kind, and you need to get this information uh, somewhere. So it's not very different comparing to using SSN parameters or remote state. You still need to have prior knowledge about where this information is stored. Would it be a remote state or would it be a parameter name? Or if you're just doing data lookup, like data source lookup in Terraform, you still need to know something about stuff that you're looking up. And who knows that? It's actually the model that creates the resource. You have all that information in the model that creates the resource. And uh, what we could do with this information is we could create models that would look like this. So imagine this is a model. And what you have here is we're just creating an app mesh. How we're creating that is not important. The parameters are not important. What is important is there is a variable called var create resources, which is Boolean, so it takes true or false. And if it's set to true, we will create an app mesh. If it's set to false, we will go and look up that app mesh. But what is happening here we actually have a knowledge in this model about how this app mesh is going to be called. We actually know its name because we're creating it just a couple of lines above, which means that we could look up it easily. And if the name of the app mesh is changing, our lookup procedure will change, which brings us to the last lines of this file where we have two outputs. And depending on what was the name or uh, what was the value of var create resources, we will either return the name from the resource or the name from the data source, which means that we could now utilize this model in two ways. We could utilize this model to create resources and, you could, and we could utilize this model in another Terraform state to actually look up those resources and the model will have a knowledge about what to look up. So you actually, you as a consumer of this model, you don't need to have any prior knowledge about what's being created. You're using outputs in both cases, and it's all encapsulated in the model. So that's why we call them self-contained. Maybe the name is not the best. Maybe it's not as descriptive as we want it to be, but that's the best name we came up so far. And another thing that I don't have an example right here, for, but what you could be also doing is in the same model, you could generate a JSON policy needed for CI to create the, all the resources because you know resources you create, right? So you could use data I, AWS IAM policy document and produce a JSON output that would describe CI policy necessary to create all the resources described here or manage them in any way. And then you can pass that to your uh, CI role. So CI role can manage everything that comes from here, giving you a really tight CI, because like usually with CI, you have to guess what's being created. And here you can come actually control the policy as you're creating resources. Again, this is more architectural contraption. It's an idea that we experiment with, with customers, but so far it's actually worked out remarkably well. And, uh, but, the drawback here, it requires a certain level of skill with uh, HCL and writing Terraform specifications. With this, I 
coming down to conclusion and a recap of what we discussed. We discussed three conceptual problems. We discussed dynamic state locations and, appro and approaches to solving them. So you could have a convention where you create many directories and you would hard code your S3 or what have you, uh, Terraform backend configuration in there, depending on each environment, which might be hard to manage because you will have a lot of directories eventually. Uh, then we discussed a way, uh, well, and we showed the example of how we could create a wrapper that will use a single directory and manage all of that for us. Then we discussed environment specific parameters. And again, you can use convention and place the, all the difference between environment and variables in the, each own directory per environment. Or you could use wrappers that will make it work for you. And we spoke about cross-state resource lookup. We actually haven't implemented the wrapper support for that because it is a complex thing to do, but there are wrappers that can do it for you, like Telegram. And we also saw that you could use conventions to work around this problem where you would use S3 bucket, SSM parameters, internal tooling or self complaint models, which brings us yeah, it's a little bit of refreshment of the wrapper that we wrote, but this is what I want to talk about. So we're actually coming to the point where we have a clear understanding of problems that we will face no matter what we do with Terraform, because all Terraform deployments will need to have a multiple environments. You will have a difference between environments. You will have a multiple states. You will need to look up parameters between those states. How you address that, this is up to you. And uh, you could use conventions. You can use wrappers. Conventions are e easy because they doesn't really require any additional tooling. Wrappers might be handy because they might force a convention on you. Like, for instance, Terragram forces you to do things a certain way. And this is ultimately where you def decide. But I want to I wanna leave one idea with you here, which is imagine that those problems with Terraform go away. And we have solution for Terraform that works out of the box. And this small wrapper we wrote, right? How many lines was it? Let's see. The 25 lines of Bash, it's easy to discard. It's just gone, in, right? And it's easy to understand. You actually understand what you are doing, and you could still use a vanilla Terraform if you if you would export TF data tier outside of this. So if you have if you have TF data tier set. So Terraform can find the Terraform directory. You, you can just use vanilla Terraform instead and use this wrapper only for initialization. And it's easy to discard it, but going down of more advanced tools with more bells and whistles will bring Elsa a dependency on that tool, right? And then removing that tool would be really hard. I saw people using Teragram and all its bells and whistles, like hooks, where they would run some shell script before they run Terraform and run some shell script after. I, I, I can see why people would do that, but then they would use it to look up values in other states, do dynamic uh, backend configuration. It's really hard to get rid of it later on. So you might get stuck with that and you would have to decide. You have to do educated decision about, do I really need that? Or can I go with vanilla Terraform? Because then it's easy for you to upgrade. It's easy for you to keep up. It's easy for you to decide. At the same time, again, wrappers, they let, if you if you are in a big company, if the skill level of Terraform writing is uneven, you might want to have a wrapper that would force convention on the people so things keep can stay consistent across the organization. So up to you to decide in the end. And uh, with this, we arrive to the last slide. All the code examples, working or not, could be found in the GitHub. That's the first link. Twitter, LinkedIn, 
You can find me there if you like to put your card. And there is also my email. You could send questions to either Twitter, DM, LinkedIn messages, our email if, if you like to. And uh, I will post the link to the slides to a slide share, and I will commit the link to the repository. So repository is the only link you need at the moment. And uh, sometime today, I will upload slides and uh, put the link to the, to the repository so you can get it from there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andre. Thank you for very detailed uh, explanation and demonstration. Uh, Terraform is a very hot skill. Everyone wants Terraform. So I think you, you help the world with your presentation to become a better place, actually. <laughs> I, I actually happy that this talk is finally done. We've been talking about that, I think, for two or three years within the team and uh, doing some doing wrappers for some clients not doing wrappers. And I always needed a way to explain it to customer what's going on. And, you know, just sitting down and conceptualizing all of that in a way that people can follow why things done this way. It takes time and the conference provides a perfect deadline to <laughs> force you a little bit to get it all written down and present to the people and you're getting a better structure. So I'm really happy to have it done. I'm happy to present it today and hopefully there will be some feedback. So I may be totally wrong and people might say it's <laughs> oh, cool shit. But I, I, I do appreciate all the feedback you will have, guys. Thank you very much, Andre. We don't have any questions in the chat. Probably people understood everything and, you know, still processing the information and how to apply it to their own work uh, on a daily basis. But thank you so much for your time being with us. Thank you for sharing your knowledge and see you around at the next conference. Yes, I hope to come in person next year, uh, participate in some panels. I will be on another panel today. So if you have, if it wasn't enough, if you want to hear more of me, join, join me on a panel later today. Thank you very much. Have a great day and see you later today then in another hall. Bye, Andre. Bye. This is all we got, dreaming about a revolution in our mind. This is all we got. Let me out of this life institution. I am angry and I am illusions. Yes, I hate, but it's not a solution. Try my best, but I am just a human. Oh, we don't need to stay with sorrow. We don't need to worship ever sorry.